Irreverent, over the top, and smart as a whip. This is the Rob Black Show. I'm Rob Black talking investing, retirement, insurance, and much, much more. Let's talk about Jamie Dimon. He is one of the best of the best in the industry of finances. He is someone very much so like Warren Buffett, who when he talks, I pay a lot of attention to. I may not like what he says, but I certainly pay attention. Um, He comes across as crass. He's one of those types that might say, you know, if workers don't want to come back to work, then we'll just fire them. That's pretty crass to me. Like he says it like he sees it. I think he's someone you should pay attention to. If I were to have a, a massive heart attack today and die, I want you to pay attention to Buffett. I want you to pay attention to Jamie Dimon. Start. And then I want you to find a couple of your own Buddhas and gurus to pay attention to. He's a mega bank CEO. He runs JP Morgan, which I think is a great long-term patient investment, uh, especially with higher interest rates. Um, or you know what's the funniest part? I, I need to fix this, and I don't know how I'm going to do it. These are normal interest rates. We were in super low interest rates for 10, 15 years. And I hope you benefited. If you didn't get real estate during those super low interest rates, your real estate may look a lot more boring in the future. As Megabank CEOs attend their annual congressional hearings, yep, on a regular basis, they talk about the economy. They get passed around by Congress. Jamie Dimon, what do you think inflation will do to the Midas citizens of South Carolina? And you're, you're seeing basically Congress people using the mega bank CEOs as you know, beating children, uh, uh, not beating children, <laughs> redheads. No, no. Um, as punching bags. How about that? And they just try to get a good quote for their reelections. JP Morgan. CEO, Jamie Dimon, he provides a written remark before he goes in front of Congress to kind of touch on where he sees macroeconomic trends going. He says, specifically, we have strong consumer spending and a robust labor market against a backdrop of historic inflation and unprecedented money tightening, also known as monetary tightening by the Federal Reserve. So let's hit that real quick one more time because it's really, really simple. Strong consumer spending, robust labor market, historic inflation, unprecedented monetary tightening by the Federal Reserve. Those are the four key elements of what he said. He says, we have a U.S. economy that is a classic tale of two cities. There are headwinds and there are tailwinds making it challenging to predict the future. His prepared marks mention strong consumer spending. Plentiful job openings that continue to surprise to the upside. Healthy businesses while also heightening, um, crushing inflation, which is eroded worker income, supply chain imbalances, the ongoing war in Ukraine, and the rapid quantitative tightening. The Federal Reserve is, is pulling out of the system. Now, you can say that, yeah, they're leaving us high and dry. They're going to ruin the economy. But you know what they're also doing? They're reloading their ammo to save the economy. He's highlighting it very, very clearly. We have plentiful job openings. Yeah, we have a healthy business environment. We have crushing inflation that is eroding worker incomes, supply chain imbalances, and the ongoing war in Ukraine, rapid quantitative tightening. For the record, just to show you the supply chain thing, remember? Antidotal evidence, Rob Black moved into a home 14 months ago, and Rob Black ordered a dining room table 13 months ago. Still not here. I'm not going to have a party, <clears throat> but next week it's it's slated to come. So Rob's going to be able to eat at a dining room table for the first time in a year, have friends over and sit like adults versus sitting in a, a booth in the kitchen. 
And listen to this, what Jamie Dimon also says, not just about supply chain imbalances. He says, um, he thinks the economy is be tipped into a recession by the Federal Reserve. But here's a great quote, quote, while these storm clouds build on the horizon, even the best and brightest economists are split to whether these could evolve into a major economic storm or something much less severe. He is calling it like he sees it, ladies and gentlemen. If you don't see that inside the stock market right now, you're missing something. I can't find reasons to be negative other than high inflation and a tightening Fed. Can't find it. Now, again, what, what, what's tightening inflation? Well, it's certainly Ukraine. It's certainly supply chain. It, it's certainly a lot of things, right? But strong labor is not a bad problem to have. <laughs> when you have it in a backdrop of a pandemic and people refusing to come back to work or bitching and moaning about it, it becomes problematic. Chief Executive Jane Frazier of Citibank, she too is speaking. She echoed the sentiments that Jamie Dimon said, quote, today, the worst of COVID may be behind us, but the economic challenges we face are no less daunting. Dimon and Frazier, other bank executives scheduled to face congressional leaders, um, include Bank of America CEO Brian Monahan, Wells Fargo CEO Charlie Scharf. Then you get leaders of regional banks like Truist and U.S. Bank Corp, PNC. Committee hearing is titled Holding Mega Banks Accountable Oversight of America's Largest Consumer Facing Banks. It's one of the reasons I have to pay attention to politics because America's largest commercial banks play a critical role in the everyday lives of consumers and the overall health of our economy. And what they see and what they testify to helps give me some insight into how to invest. Again, let me throw down these names if you want to put them in Google Alerts. Anytime Jamie Dimon talks, I pay attention. Jane Frazier, Brian Moynihan from Bank of America, a little less so Wells Fargo CEO Charlie Scharf because they have a lot of problems. They're still fixing it, Wells Fargo. On the account of banks, executives are poised to lament over hurdles facing their industry. Jamie Dimon, he moans and he groans about capital requirements and the sum of liquid capital financial institutions are required to hold by regulators to ensure that the majority of bank holdings are not compromised or filled with investments that increase the risk of default. Back when we had the financial crisis and Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers went down and out, completely gone, we had to do something. And our regulators from the Federal Reserve said, hey, I think we should make them hold more money so that if there is a problem with, say, bad loans on mortgages or bad, I don't know, a run on money, a severe recession, that the banks can still lend money. They could still lose money without losing their core assets, causing them to become illiquid. So that's what Jamie Dimon's moaning about. Now, here's what America thinks about Jamie Dimon. Oh, he's just a capitalist pig. Uh, he's just upset that he didn't get another bazillion dollar bonus this year. He makes millions of dollars a year. Some of his staff makes $15 to $20 a year. I get it. I, I get why Americans don't like big bankers, but I'm going to tell you. Jamie Dimon's all that in a bucket of chicken. When he says we are a tale of two cities that have strong headwinds and strong tailwinds, he is not missing the mark. That's how you should feel, in my opinion. There's opportunity that's going to come out of the Fed reloading, raising interest rates, cutting their balance sheet. They have more ammo to help us in the future. I'm Rob Black, talking all things financial, money, investing, and more. A straightforward approach to managing your money. The Rob Black Show. As always, thanks for listening. I'm dedicated to giving you enough financial news to enrich you, to make your soil full of nutrients so you can grow your 
oak tree of a retirement account. One of the areas that I like to play in is stocks. I know I shouldn't. I should really be pushing index funds and ETFs for you that are diversified and telling you to go about your merry way. But something in me tells me you're going to do stocks with or without me. So I try to show you what I see in the stock market of stocks, what I like and don't like. Um, 20 years ago, I started buying Apple shares of Apple because there was a CEO of B Operating Systems, B-E-O-S, B Operating Systems, a um, guy named Gasset. I think it was Jean-Paul Gasset. I'm getting his middle name wrong. It wasn't Jean-Luc, but it was Gasset. It was Jean something. Um, and he was kind of a competitor of Next, which was an operating system that Steve Jobs was basically fired from Apple. And he went out and started Next. And he went out and started Pixar. And Gasset was a, a peer, if you will, of Apple's. Um, and a lot of people thought Apple, when they needed a new operating system to really start competing with Windows, that Apple would buy B operating systems because it was it was it was a lovely operating system. But no, Apple went back to Steve Jobs and said, "We'll buy your operating system, bring you back to the company." Greatest move Apple ever made, right? But I wrote a newsletter on a hot stock tip. Called, can Apple be saved? And I wrote, maybe, because of B operating systems. This was back in 98. So you do the math there, right? And Apple was incredibly cheap. I don't know where it was stock adjusted, but probably a buck 50. So that's when I started buying shares of Apple. In theory, I got that one smack dab right. But I got it right for the wrong reasons. I thought B operating systems was going to be a, was going to be done, and not next and Steve Jobs. But I was talking about could Apple be saved because they had a, a they they made Macs, and they had one percent of the computer market out there, and PCs had ninety nine percent HP, Dell, Compaq. They own the world of, of personal computers. And I was like, 1% can grow to 2% pretty easily. And that's exponential. So that's the story of me and Apple, right? Now let's do another stock pick right here, right now. Uh, I don't think this is the next Apple, but I think they're an interesting play in the short term, medium term, and potentially long term. So it kind of checks a couple boxes for me. It's a company called Generac. They make generators for when power goes out. I think Tesla makes generators when power goes out called solar batteries. Generac, though, is going to work in the Pacific, uh, in the North, Al uh, North Atlantic states, Northwest, Northeast, I'm sorry. It's going to work in the Canadian cold whereas solar doesn't work quite as well. Record heat waves, western wildfires, rolling blackouts, hurricanes, all are good news for generator maker Generac Holdings. Its shares have been falling sharply this year. That creates an opportunity as we head into hurricane season. Uh, the headlines become very, very big. North Carolina without power for 13 days in a row. Well, people with generators are okay. Generac is the dominant name in residential standby power generation with about three quarters of the U.S. market. Those sales make up half the company's revenue with the remainder coming from commercial and industrial customers. Little wonder that Generac is known as a storm stock. It is a play on hurricanes, which happen pretty much so like clockwork until this year. The United States has had a hurricane in the month of August every year for as long as I can remember, except this year. So it's known as a storm stock. Sales shot up $1.5 billion in 2013, nearly double what it was two years previously. Generac just kept going. 
any event involving outages, including storms, blackouts, utility failure, whatever, it drives increased awareness and therefore increased sales. Um, it's considered a necessity to have power to live at times. It runs on propane big enough to run most of the house in the event of an outage. It's not uncommon in rural neighborhoods where branches from old Norway maple seems to come down, you know, on the power lines on a regular basis. It's reassuring to know that it's there for the next weather event. If you've ever lost power for two, three, four days, you feel, and I know this is a bad comparison, but you feel like you live in the middle ages. Don't open the fridge ever. Like, don't open the fridge. You can let all the cold air out. Just 6% of US households own generators. If it can expand one percentage point, like I'm telling you, Apple was the reason I bought shares of Apple. It has the ability to increase sales by 340% and earnings by 664%. To me, California looks like an untapped market that could fuel growth for Generac. It's way cheaper than getting a... Um, it's way cheaper than getting um, a solar panel and a solar battery. One of the problems with generators... So a lot of times they run on natural gas and during wildfires, you don't have access to natural gas. A lot of times your local utility will say, we're going to turn off all the natural gas as well as the electricity. So that's why sometimes when it runs on propane, you're like, oh, you're better off. I have a neighbor here that has a generator. I've got a solar battery. When we lose our power, which we probably lose six, seven times a year, maybe for like planned outages, upgrades to the system. It's not that and windy nights kind of thing, but hearing her generator fire up, it's like, I live in a valley, so you hear it quite loud. California hasn't been historically a home standby generator market. States in the Northeast, for instance, have penetration rates of 10 to 20% for the winter months. Less than two and a half percent of Californians have standby power. Generate is acting like a broken stock. Its shares have dropped 50% this year, making it the 16th worst performing stock in the S&P 500. So for me, it's compelling to look at. The greening of power generation has raised some concerns about obsolescence, and everyone has solar panels on the roof now in California. No one needs a generator, but solar panels and battery storage still cost multiples of what a, a Generac system costs. It's all about exponential growth, potential. I'm Rob Black. Resources to help you manage your money. Visit robblackshow.com. That's robblackshow.com. A personal financial plan with custom investment advice. That's why Rob Black has partnered with EP Wealth Advisors. With over $12 billion in assets under management and more than 80 financial professionals at the helm, EP services were built with you in mind. How can they help you? Find out at robblackshow.com. Rob Black Show. Dot com. Joining me now, Patrick O'Hare with briefing.com. It is Fed Day. It's always interesting what happens on Fed Day because it is kind of like you expect. It's a, a big mess. A lot goes on. We start one way. We may go a different way. We may go way higher. We may go way lower. It's impossible to say at this point in time. Mr. O'Hare, briefing.com. I start my day each day and every day with your page one column. And today, it's pretty much so dedicated to the Federal Reserve. Is is that what we have going on, or is there anything else you can find? Yeah, good morning, Rob. Nice to be back with you. Um, well, clearly, the, uh, the the Fed meeting is is the focal point today. Um, but there is something else going on that is kind of being marginalized at the moment because of the focus on the Fed. And that's, you know, what President Putin announced in terms of, you know, mobilizing more reservists to, uh, to basically ramp up the war effort in Ukraine. Um, that is surprisingly kind of become a backseat issue today, uh, but uh, could come home to roost uh, a little bit further down the road here. I think some world leaders are talking to the UN today. So that, that they will hit the, the news cycle, but probably not until this evening. Um, but this morning we do get the Federal Reserve and it's widely expected 75 basis points. Some people are saying 100. 
Um, it's kind of a shock and awe. I think I saw one analyst say 150 basis points. Just get it over with. Rip off the Band-Aid. Um, seeing that it takes quite a few months for interest rates to bleed into this system, we're seeing softening in housing. We're seeing uh, softening in the rental market. Maybe not as fast as the Fed wants, but we're seeing some of the high end. Um, what more does the Fed want, do you think? Or And again, this is a national pastime, right? What's What does the Fed think? Who's going to win the Super Bowl? Right. Lots. Well, I think uh, to be a little bit flippant, <laughs> I think the Fed wants about another 600 basis points off the rate of inflation. Uh, okay. We have, uh, you know, CPI was up 8.3% year over year, and, and the Fed's target is 2%. Uh, now, granted, that is, you know, driven largely by a, a PCE inflation forecast. But nonetheless, um, you know, we saw quite the nasty reaction after that August CPI report because it was apparent to all market participants that the inflation rate is not coming down as quickly as people would like to see it. And therefore, uh, it leads to the conclusion that, you know, the Fed is going to have to not only be more aggressive with its rate hikes, but be uh, more stubborn in terms of staying at these higher interest rate levels. Um, so, um, so the Fed certainly wants to see you know inflation trending lower and getting there, you know, sooner rather than later. But um, I think one of the things that really jumped out to us at Briefing.com with the Jackson Hole speech is that it was finally that that moment where um, where you got a sense that Fed Chair Powell and the Fed really means business now in terms of regaining the inflation fighting credibility that it that it lost, frankly. And, uh, you know, that's also why, you know, we don't think it uh, we don't think that the Fed chair is going to come out today and sound as if he has a softer tone. Um, you know, I said in my page one column that I think that that would be foolish uh, because it would just uh, it would just undo all of the uh, good inflation fighting will that was built with that Jackson Hole speech. Um, so, um, you know, it will. I think the market's reaction today will largely depend on if there's any you know new information or a new tone from the Fed chair. But if you get more of the same with the 75 basis point rate increase that's widely expected. Uh, you could see a market that does do well in the wake of that uh, determination because it has done so poorly uh, in recent weeks or certainly since Jackson Hole up to this point. And it's created a little bit of an, a short-term oversold condition. And so the market might find a reason to rally on the basis that uh, that things were better than feared today. I saw an interesting quote about the Federal Reserve. They have to hurt someone. Um, my home price is down on a year-to-year -year basis. My well, no, that's not actually true. On a month to month basis, maybe it peaked in January and I'm starting to project that I forgot I had gains in the last half, but it's also hurting my 401k. Um, but I'm considered wealthy. Um, on the other hand, if if you keep rates low, maybe I keep hitting 52 week highs in my net worth, but maybe the middle class and the lower class of America um, have trouble fighting inflation, keeping up with cost of living versus wage inflation that they're not getting to the tune of cost of living inflation. Um, do you agree that the Fed has to hurt someone here? Well, you know, I don't like to say that it has to hurt somebody, but it inevitably will um, because, you know, the, the stated aim right now is to weaken demand. And uh, the Fed chair himself kind of keeps pointing at the tightness of the labor market as something that is uh, creating undue concern at the Fed about inflation pressures you know, remaining high. And, you know, it, you know, the Fed indirectly wants to weaken that labor market to take off some of the wage-based inflation pressures that's bleeding through to some of these, you know, the broad-based inflation trends we're seeing. Uh, and, uh, and so ultimately to help alleviate that issue, um, you know, the Fed won't directly say it, but, you know, um, it, it wants you know, it's going to need people to lose their jobs, frankly. Uh, you need to see a higher unemployment rate uh, so that um, so that the labor market or the pool of labor becomes less demanding with wage uh, uh, demands and that uh, employers, you know, kind of 
you know, regain some leverage in terms of uh, suggesting that they can't afford to pay these higher wages because they expect demand to weaken and they won't have the sales growth and the profit growth necessary to to meet those higher wage demands. So, um, so unfortunately, it's an inevitable outcome, you know, when the Fed is in a tightening cycle and particularly as it moves rapidly to a restrictive level. Um, there's going to be pain, as the Fed chair did admit, uh, for for some people. Um, and it's just a question of how many people, and that gets back to the issue of, is this a soft landing or a hard landing? And with the you know rapid pace of increases thus far, uh, and a Fed that doesn't sound like it's willing to back off yet, um, or let alone cut interest rates, uh, we think that the risk of a hard landing has increased, uh, given the uh, the fact that the that the pace of change has been so rapid. It's interesting. I'm looking at your column right now, having read it earlier. It didn't dawn on me, but looking at it, you don't mention one single stock today. Not one. You mentioned no. Putin. You mentioned the Federal Reserve. I don't think I've ever seen that phenomenon out of you. Um, and you, you probably well, have, to be fair. I guess, you know, subconsciously, perhaps, it's just it's the manifestation of, of, of knowing that this Fed meeting is the focal point, right? Because everything will feed off of what is heard today, uh, not only uh, seen in the directive, but heard from Fed Chair Powell. And then that will, of course, create a lot of individual stock reactions. But I guess I could have pointed out how General Mills uh, reported better than expected earnings and raised its guidance for, for fiscal year 23, uh, which is good news for General Mills. But the driver behind that increased guidance and behind its, you know, uh, very good earnings results was the fact that they were able to pass through higher prices. And, uh, you know, and even with their guidance, they're suggesting that they're likely to see low double digit percentage increases in terms of, uh, you know, price realization. Um, that's not a good thing. You know, double digit <laughs> price increases. That's not what the Fed wants to hear. That's not what a consumer wants to see. And it just kind of gets to the heart of the matter that, you know, we might be stuck with, you know, higher inflation for longer than people might you know, might want to believe. And that the consequence of that is that you're stuck with a Federal Reserve and it's going to be a lot more hawkish with higher interest rates for longer than people think. One of the more interesting articles that I've, I've looked at in the last three months basically said we've had 15 years of basically no interest rates. Well, that's not quite right, but it's close. It's the right idea. And it said, prepare for the next 15 years of more normal interest rates. And you and I talked last week, like mortgage rates aren't crazy right now. They're crazy compared to what they were in the last five years, but not in the last 50 years. Uh, do you think we're in a, a, a shifting market that it's going to be a different 15 year or 10 year or five year cycle than it was um, as an investor, the way we approached it in the last 10, 15? Well, Has the game changed? Yeah, entering yeah, we're entering something new here. The duration is is uh, in question, but um, you know it's funny you mentioned that, Rob, and it's kind of I think born out of the conversation you and I did have last week. Is and and what you oftentimes ask me at the end of these interviews is you know what I'm working on for the big picture column uh, that I post on Friday, mm -hmm. and one of the main ideas I'm I'm exploring right now and researching is just this idea of what you know what quote normal looks like. Right. Because we have been spoiled for so long with these rock bottom interest rates and with a stock market that, you know, seems to go up double digit percentage, you know, most years um, and and a Fed that's, you know, out buying treasuries <laughs> instead of, you know, selling them. Um, so, you know, that column might be oriented this week around just kind of a, a, a chart snapshot of, you know, what normal has looked like. And so people can kind of get their mind around that uh, the period you just talked about, whether it's just from the financial crisis up to now or or even since the pandemic started, that, that that's an abnormal situation, you know, where you've got interest rates at the zero bound um, and, you know, and where we've had very, you know, uh, below trend GDP growth for an extended period of time. So, um, so that that'll be probably the focus of that column this week, but, um, but it's definitely something that people are going to have to get acclimated to, I think for, for a few years anyway, that uh, they're going to be dealing with a higher um, interest rate environment. And that will, you know, lead to some different decisions than they might've made when it was at rock bottom interest rates. 
Thanks very much. It's Patrick O'Hare with Briefing.com, a reliable source of international and domestic news. Big day on the Fed. His writings are insightful. I use them every day. Find us at robblackshow.com. robblackshow.com. Let's talk EVs, electric vehicles. Electric vehicle stocks have had a rough year. But if you're looking to gain exposure, I'm going to go over some names that you can consider. So the broker advisor, we're taking any action on any stocks ever mentioned during this show. All stocks have risks. We've seen the Joe Biden Inflation Reduction Act. It's a funny name for a bill that to me is really about I don't know, helping the environment with a little bit of inflation reduction. 2022 has been a rough year for growth stocks. So whether you're a semiconductor or a software, a hardware maker of technology, or if you're an EV stock, it's kind of been all lumped together, sell, 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 anything with a high valuation. That's great news if you have money to put into the market. It's horrible news if all your money was involved in growth stocks. The value of a stock today is determined by its future earnings discounted versus today's prices. The higher interest rates go, the lower those future earnings are worth in today's dollars. I'm not going to explain that concept. If you don't get it, you don't get it. It's one of the ones that... It's more problematic for people to understand. The Federal Reserve has been very aggressive in fighting inflation with higher interest rates, thus hitting all growth stocks with an ugly stick. The notion of an electric vehicle company may seem antiquated in just a few years. Um, just throwing that down for you. We're quickly becoming used to electric vehicles. My first electric vehicle or semi-electric vehicle was a hybrid Toyota Prius. And it was probably the worst car I've ever owned. It felt like a golf cart. It, It wasn't a good experience. So to me, that kept me out of electric vehicles or hybrids for a while. Interesting how Toyota really hasn't made a big bet on electric vehicles. Right? You picking up what I'm putting down? They're a big car maker. They have not gone all in. Expanding the market in the recently passed Inflation Reduction Act, which introduced a $7,500 tax credit for new EVs and a $4,000 credit for used ones. There are rules and limitations to the EV tax credit. It's a big incentive for you to go green especially when you consider the total cost of ownership of an EV over its lifetime. I have a Tesla that doesn't need oil changes. It doesn't need, it's, it's all electric. Fixing it doesn't involve like taking apart the engine or working on belts. It's been a nice perk. As electricity rates have gone higher, it's been a really nice perk to charge it off my roof. So I get the perks, right? You do too, I think. Every stock in the electric vehicle world is slightly speculative to greatly speculative. For instance, there's a company called Polestar, Polestar. Ticker symbol is PSNY. It has six different electric vehicles out there. If I were to call it a poor man's Tesla, you would laugh at me, but it is a poor man's Tesla. The electric performance hardtop convertible Roadster is based on the Polster Precept concept car. It's got a pretty interesting look. Um, It's got pretty good electric performance and the thrill of fresh air when you take the top down. Once in my life, when I was 19 years old, I went on a road trip where I rented a really you know, classic Mustang convertible because I wanted to put 
the top down and enjoy the fresh air of the road trip, right? That novelty wore off pretty quickly. Um, but in my head, it was a romantic novelty. So this is a risky one. They're never going to compete with Tesla in volume, volume, volume. They're expected to sell $200,000 vehicles in the year 2026. That's insane. So far, they've delivered about 21,000 vehicles. Analysts don't love the stock. But if you were to watch who could acquire them, um, it could be a large China automaker. It could be Volvo. There's different plays there for sure. A company whose car I really, really like and might be my next electric vehicle is Lucid. Ticker symbol LCID. Shares are down nearly 57% year to date. Not helping the shares was late August news that Lucid filed an S3 uh, registration filing with the Securities and Exchange Commission. S filings are filings that happen in between the quarter. Q filings are what happen every 90 days. K filings are what happen every year. I read these. They're legal documents. And you learn to get through boilerplate, 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 boilerplate. Then you get to important information. The company has some liquidity issues. It's going to raise $8 million over the next three years for offering shares, which means they're going to hurt current shareholders by printing new shares. They've got 37,000 reservations for its Lucid Air luxury sedan, up from 30,000 reported in the first quarter. Reservations represent $3.5 billion in potential future income. That's compelling. If you're Ford or GM and you're like, hmm, do we come up with our own brand or do we buy someone else's brand and slap our logo on it? I'll tell you the Lucid powertrain technology is innovative. It's competitive. It could compete with Tesla, but not on volume. But damn, does that car look nice. Inside and outside. Ford is going to be a big player in electricity. I'm going over some stock ideas for you. They are excited to be in the electrical vehicle world. They're cutting jobs from operations. Part of its structural, let's cut gas vehicle structure and restructuring to an electric vehicle company. The F-150 Lightning is hot to the point that they're raising prices. Um, I think Ford is trading at incredibly cheap multiples. So if you look at Lucid, you're like, that's a really expensive stock on multiples. If you look at Ford, you're like, that's a really cheap stock if you're able to sell a lot of vehicles. And electric vehicles have a lot more profit. So Tesla figured that out, and Ford and GM were like, dang, man, you figured out how to make money in cars. Berkshire Hathaway is a player. They own a Chinese automotive electronics firm. They don't own completely, but they have a big investment in BYD. But they've been cutting that investment, so be cautious on that one. Berkshire Hathaway gets you diversification, but BYD gets you into electric vehicles in China. Their share of new energy vehicles, also known as NEVs, in China is 24.7%. So if you want a lot of diversification, but still a big generator of uh, vehicles to the tune of 2 million plus, consider Berkshire Hathaway's backdoor play into BYD. Obviously, Tesla is a play on electric vehicles. Rivian Automotive is kind of a, uh, a play very similar to Lucid. Rivian is ticker symbol R-I-V-N. They're all making vehicles so far, right? Or have some sort of play into making vehicles. Rivian is on solid footing. The company is simplifying its production and supply chain, including scrapping the entry-level versions of both its electric truck and SUV by eliminating the Explore package, which had a starting price of 67000 in favor of a more expensive adventure package. 
it's trying to deliver more vehicles by making their their production line simpler. Its previous production rows appear to be lessening. They have a $5 billion plant being built in Georgia. They're not building a $5 billion plant because they want to go out of business. They're building it because they want to stay in business. Another company to consider is Hyundai. They've got a couple EV hits on their hands with the Hyundai Ionic 5 and the Kia EV6. I actually like those cars, uh, not to the point of buying one, but pretty darn close. I think the I- Ionic 5 looks kind of cool. When I see it on the road, I go, ooh, what's that car? Their reasonable size while being relatively affordable. That's something that's really not alive and well in the market right now. So. There's a a company called Li Automotive, ticker symbol LI, obviously a Chinese EV maker. So you're going to run into some Chinese risk where sometimes China's government plays like they're capitalists and sometimes they play as if they're communists. Um, But again, China's market is too big to ignore. I just gave you eight, nine, or 10 electric vehicle stocks that are well-funded and are going to stick around because they're well-funded or they're going to be acquired which is also a play on electric vehicle stocks. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter Rob Black Show, YouTube Rob Black Show. A straightforward approach to managing your money. The Rob Black Show. So sometimes I tell a tasteless joke where I say, my dad battered battered us. He never fried us. He just rolled us around in egg and flour. He battered us, but he never... Okay, bad, right? Let's transition that thought to the market's getting battered. When the market gets beat up, I like looking for small stocks. I I I have the best time shopping in a down market. And I'm gonna this is a confession. I, I like looking for stocks that are beat up. And I'm looking for a trade in this scenario. I'm looking to put $10,000 on something to make a fast 30% when the market rebounds, if the market rebounds, if I'm trying to time the market. This is not a good strategy. This is a stupid strategy. But when the markets get beat up, the good and the bad go out. People just throw, they give up. They, They get frustrated. So that's when I feel I can maybe possibly catch a trade. I don't try to catch trades when markets are at all time highs. I try to catch a trade when markets are getting battered. Speaking of which, the United States men's national soccer team got battered by Japan today. Not looking good for the World Cup chances. Um, That was a bit of a shocker. And I know you're saying battered. Was it one nothing? Was it the soccer battery of one nothing? Kind of was. But we didn't show up to play. Um, so the market's getting battered and I, I look for opportunity. I'm being honest with you. And will I pull it off? I don't know. But I'm gonna share with you a stock that I'm looking at. And now I'm not allowed to go out and buy it for three days because of that. But I'm trying to show you how pros play the game. Um first and foremost, I kind of okay, the VIX is at 28, still not volatile enough. I want to see it spike to 30. And then 35, then 40. It's picking up. It's just not where it needs to be, in my opinion, to put in a market bottom. Okay, so the company that I'm looking at, it's a Norwegian battery startup. I'm pretty sure that 80% of America can't find Norway on a map. We kind of know it's one of those three, but we don't know which one it is. Is it Sweden? Is it Norway? Is it Denmark? Like, it's one of those three up there. So it's a Norwegian battery startup. It's a company called Frey Battery, F-R-E-Y. Don't like the name. Don't like the fact that it's Norwegian. But I like the fact that it's a car battery startup. Morgan Stanley analyst Adam Jonas raised his price target on the company to $26 from $18 and named the company his top pick. Okay. Where is it now, you're saying? He has a $26 target. It's $13. $13. $13. Now, I want it to go lower. Six months ago, it was at, what was it six months ago? 
Um, well, eleven and a half dollars. Now it's at thirteen sixty five. So it's a big move in six months. But at that, in those times, in the last June market pullback, it went down to six dollars and sixty six cents. Now we have another market pullback, and it's only at thirteen sixty five because it's been named a top pick. Fifty two week high on this puppy is kind of right here. Uh, Fifteen dollars. It's now down to thirteen sixty five. It's not cheap enough for me. It hasn't fallen enough. But short term, mid term, and long term look attractive. The technology looks very attractive. Let's talk about the technology, shall we? Let's get some sizzle to go with that steak. Let's not just have a big piece of meat and say, "Hmm, it looks tasty." Let's hear it. Twenty six dollar price target includes a bull and bear scenario. So he's saying, in a best case and a worst case scenario. His most bullish forecast is for it to go to $60 a share. It's $13 right now. He has a $26 target on it. That's more than 300% upside from recent levels. Now, who's the analyst who's saying this? I don't know. Guy named Adam Jonas. Do we know Adam Jonas? I don't know Adam Jonas. Do you know Adam Jonas? You don't know Adam Jonas. Frey. Um is focused on producing rechargeable lithium ion batteries. Okay, now we get it. There's the sizzle for electric vehicles, but Tesla does that. They're going to make energy storage markets uh, part of their addressable market. Okay, here's the rub. This technology uses less materials and time, saving costs. That's the unique thing about the company. The company is also opening a new battery plant in Norway called Giga Arctic. It has the capacity to manufacture about 29 gigawatt hours of battery capacity annually. That's enough to power roughly half a million EVs a year. He sees the analyst sees capacity growing to 300 gigawatt hours by 2035. His bear case assumes Frey opens up only about 80 gigawatt hours by capacity by then. He's projecting out to 2035, not 2025. He's looking 13 years out. The company has partnerships with HANA Technology, which makes equipment used in battery production, and signed a deal with NIDEC out of Japan for the maker of electric motors to buy Frey battery cells. Frey replaces Ferrari as Jonas's top pick. He still rates the latter shares a buy. Yeah, you can buy shares of Ferrari. He rates Tesla as a buy. So he's covered this whole sector, and he's saying this is an important player. Stock's up 18% so far this year up until today. That does include today's numbers, which if I am seeing correctly, it's down about 11% today. It doesn't work as an even comparison. He thinks the stock is boosted by the Inflation Reduction Act, which has helped a lot of renewable and energy storage stocks. The shares have gained more than 50% since July. They had a surprise agreement between Senator Chuck Schumer and Joe Manchin that allowed that legislation, the Inflation Reduction Act, to pass. And this was in the right place at the right time. If it gets enough of a pullback, I'm going to be a little bit more interested. As of now, not so much. Um, if it underperforms, I'd be a little bit more attractive to it. So clean energy stocks are beating and breaking out the market. Listen to some of the press releases, not press releases, but wire stories. Frey Battery was awarded an agreement to UK-based Impact featuring its Lambert product for the automated casting unit cell assembly equipment for its planned battery cell productions in Norway. It is filed for a $500 million mixed securities offering, which dilutes current shareholders. Not good news. It's going to use the money in theory wisely they opened the execution of the 38 gigawatt li ion battery binding cells agreement they've entered in a module and pack joint venture for energy storage solutions with nidec um there's goldman sachs is the only company i can really see that's following it back in august they announced a strategic alliance frame agreement to south korea based hana technology Two companies are going to jointly develop equipment and automation solutions. They've announced the establishment of a technology resources campus and business unit inside of Japan. It is a truly development company. 
that again is trying to do ion batteries for cars and storage systems cheaper with less materials. If you've heard anything out of Elon Musk in the last couple of months, it's that we need a tremendous amount of lithium. We need a, tr- we, they may even get into the business of mining lithium. Uh, Frey Battery has entered into a reservation agreement with Shangzhou, Senior New Energy Materials, and Senior Material AB out of Europe. Um, they're doing the industrial work. They're not a name brand in any way, shape, or form. They are very much so uh, dealing with big government contracts and big corporations who want to get into selling electric vehicles and making up. I guess a profit or being at the right place at the right time. That's the stock of the week, a company called Frey Battery. Ticker symbol is F R E Y. Um, are they earning money? No, they're not earning money. Earning money. The chart looks very attractive. Um, and what do I mean by that? If you pull up a chart of the company, you'll see that in the last four months, as it's moved higher, it goes up and it comes down and it doesn't hit a new low, it hits a higher low when it pulls back. So it very much so looks like a a 45 degree angle of slowly moving up. Maybe you'd say like a 30 degree angle is the better way of putting that, right? Um, How much are they losing? A lot. So the market cap is $1.5 billion. It's small. It could be acquired, I think, is the right way of looking at it. It's got a 52-week trading range between $6.42 and $16.57. If you're looking for important statistics like profit margin, it's not there. They don't have one. If you take a look at operating margin, it's not there. Return on equity, negative 41%. Not good. Return on assets, negative 23%. So this is the riskiest stock that I'm looking at right now. The riskiest stock in the world of Rob. Safest stock that I'm looking at right now, and I can't decide which one I'm going to go with, is Coca-Cola. I know you're saying, that's quite a swing there, Rob. Um, I'm going to look at the cash burn rate. I'm going to look at total debt. I'm going to look at timetables on when products are going to get turned on and they're going to start making money. I'm going to look at the percentage of the float that's short. Um, I'm not looking for dividends. I'm not looking for splits. I am not looking for, I'm looking for cash flow. That's really what I'm looking for. I'm Rob Black talking all things financial. That's the stock of the week.